Testing, testing, one, two. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, welcome to BWTM Sports, live and exclusive. We have the uh, super middleweight contender, unbeaten, all the way from the States, Rob Bravo Brandt. Rob, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing real well. Just got done with a hard day of sparring today, feeling, uh, feeling ready. Okay, for those people who don't know who Rob Brandt is and you know let the world know who you are i'm uh, currently 22 and old this is going to be my first competition at uh, super middleweight for this tournament i am uh in the world boxing super series in the, in the first quarterfinal round against the uh, ex uh light heavyweight contender jürgen reimer in sherwin germany so this is just uh my kind of my time to shine you know it's my, my first uh the true crossroads fight you know looking at, uh, at a man who's uh toward the end of his career but has accomplished quite a bit and myself who's uh kind of an up-and-comer who's uh looking to to make his bones on the on the big stage so this is uh this is kind of my time to shine you know, very confident very ready now your trainer derek james and i have some history we do go back a little bit we have a very good relationship and i know the the gym you've got has got some fabulous fighters apart from yourself there is obviously Errol Spence Jr. and uh, the other Charlo brother. Um, how does that make you feel being around champions? You know, it's, it's always that sense of motivation. You know, you see that uh, you know you see them every day. You see that they uh, the things that they go through in order to not just get a title but to keep it. Because it's one thing to to win something to, of that magnitude. It's a whole other level in order to to, to keep it. Like I said, it's hard to get there. It's harder to stay there. So it's just always a sense of motivation, knowing that you know that uh, this is something that I can do, and once I once I do capture a title, I'm going to keep it. Fantastic. Let's talk a little bit about because a lot of people focus on the professional career. Let's talk about a little bit about your amateur career and what you did as an amateur for the minute, Rob. Uh, yeah, as an amateur, I was on the. Uh, I, I had my first fight in 2007. I've been boxing about 2006. Had my first uh, amateur about 2007, and then uh, I actually started winning national titles relatively quickly. Um, I, I had, uh, you know, some local tournaments, national tournaments that I'd won um, right off the gate in 2007. It was like the ringside world championship. 2008, I ended up winning the, uh, the under-19 for the United States uh, to be on the U.S. team, which uh, sent me to Mexico to, uh, to fight uh, for the USA youth team, under-19 team. And then uh, the following year, I, I, uh, 2009, I won the U.S. national championships. And uh, the year after that, I won the national golden gloves. And then uh, a couple other smaller uh, national titles after that, and then I ended up losing in the in the Olympic trials, um, where uh, at light heavyweight, ah. uh, where, I can, where I did my entire amateur career. Okay, um, talk to us along the way of your amateur career. First of all, what got you into boxing? You know, it's, uh, I was always interested in it. Uh, my actually, my father was a collegiate uh, American football player, uh, so I was actually always kind of went that route of playing football. My, my, my whole life and then I just there's always something about uh, the individuality of, of boxing and knowing that you know it's truly a sport that when you put into it you're going to get out of it so that's really what, what drew my interest to it and of course you know it's uh when you're when you're when you're younger you know the idea of you know being the being the tough guy you know being uh being the one of the toughest dude in your neighborhood or or you know in your in your state or your area it just it, it appealed to me you know I mean it's uh something I wanted to be the best at something not necessarily be a part of a team that is the best. So uh, the boxing was, the, of course, the the only the only sport that really could come to mind when you think of something that, uh, of that magnitude. 
So when you got in the ring for the first time, I've spoken to so many people, not so many people, this question, I get so many different answers. What was it like when you first took your first punch in the nose or the chin or to the body? Uh, the first one I remember was, was a shot directly to my nose and, and the blood started gushing. And, you know, it's like that, uh, whoa, you know, that feeling where, you know, that's, that's not like, you know, an untrained person who punched you in the face. That's a trained guy who just hit you, you know, <laughs> it was surprising, but it was more motivating than anything else. You know, I didn't, I didn't ever want to get hit like that again. So I took it more seriously in terms of, okay, well, how do I block that? How do I make sure that doesn't happen to me a second time? And of course, you know, it does happen to you a second, a third, you know, even a hundred times on your road to getting to the point that, that you want to, to stay at. But it, uh, it was more motivating than anything else. So I, I didn't want that. I didn't want to get hit like that again. But the, I mean, the first, you know, first instinct was like, wow, you know, uh, holy shit. You know, that, that, <laughs> that just happens, excuse my language, but, uh, That's all right. you know, the shock, you know. So then from that, what was it that kept you going? Some people, when they get hit on the nose, they get hit in the chin. In the reality, it's a bit of hard work and they're having to dedicate themselves week in, week out, make sacrifices. What kept Rob Brandt going? You know, I'm, I'm extremely competitive. You know, I, uh, if I'm walking my dog down the street, I need to make sure that I'm, I'm walking faster than the person who's across the street. <laughs> You know, so, you know, when I got hit the first time, it's always that sense of, uh, I wouldn't say anger, but uh, that kind of competitive nature where I would honor to instantly hit that person back and I wanted to get the better of that situation. So, I mean, with, with that, you know, I ended up getting the better of that situation. And then, you know, you go into your, your first amateur bout and then, you know, I, all I wanted to do was, was win and I, and I continued to, to do really well uh, and win. And, you know, they, I hate losing so much that, uh, that, that really uh, kind of motivates me in a certain What's your greatest memory as an amateur? Can you say it one more time? I'm sorry. What is your greatest memory as an amateur? The, 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 the one moment that stands out the most for you as an amateur? You know, it's actually my one moment that, uh, that sticks out to me the most. Uh, it's actually not one that, that, that was fought in the ring, but the, uh, being able to hold the, the U.S. flag at the, the World Championships in Milan, Italy. Uh, for the uh, 2009 World Championships, mm -hmm. uh, and I was the I got to be the flag bearer for the for the team, and, and that's uh, that's the moment that that will stick out for the rest of my life. See, you know, it's, uh, it's a certain sense of pride in, 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 in being able to to hold that flag. Or so many other countries were there. Absolutely, I've seen the flag then when you held the flag and the flag now. Does it hold the same feeling for you, despite all the political climate that's in America at the moment? Uh, you know, yes, it still holds a lot of weight. Of course, like any country, there's going to be no problems in, in this step. But this is this is where I was raised. This is where I was, you know, where I was born. This is, you know, the, this country made me the person that I am now. So, you know, of course, there's there, there's shady parts of, of wherever you go. But yes. this is what made me. So this is, uh, I still have a, a lot of pride for where I come from. Fantastic. So where exactly do you hail from? I was actually born and raised in St. Paul, Minnesota, which is uh, uh, just south of the Canadian border. Right. Okay, okay. Uh, in, in Minnesota, how far is that from Minneapolis? Minneapolis, I'm from St. Paul, so Minneapolis and St. Paul are, you know, they're about 20 minutes apart. You know, they call it the Twin Cities. So they're, they're very close. So my favorite artist is from Minneapolis, you know, Prince. Oh yeah, Purple Rain. Absolutely, absolutely. You can't be from, you can't be from Minneapolis. Yeah, you can't be from Minneapolis and not know Prince. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a great story about the Purple Man, but we can save that for another day. Okay, so, <laughs> so you, you, um, we talked about a little bit about your amateur career. We talked about what you've done. Um, along the way, I know that when I talk to, particularly when I talk to American fighters along the pathway because america is so big there's always the possibility you may run into super uh, future superstars or future undefeated fighters or future world champions on your path to what you did before coming becoming a pro did you come across or spar with any well-known fighters um you know pretty much everybody that came out of that 2012 team at the, the light heavyweight area i mean i, I had been in there with uh you know, I, honestly, no. I, I mean, I would say that, uh, you know, there are pros that were in Minnesota, of course. Like, the Minnesota's a, not really a, a hotbed of, uh, of boxing in the United States. 
but there are some, some local, you know, celebrities. Man, a guy made me of Matt Vanda when I first uh, started uh, boxing, and I got this far. The guy named Matt Vanda who was considered kind of like a, a local celebrity. Right. You know, that was, uh, that was uh, the, you know, things that stick out. I mean, nowadays, I'm, you know, say as a pro, I have far with some, some, some bigger name guys. There's the, you know, the Charlo and, uh, and Spence Jr. Um, and many other undefeated fighters. But, uh, you know, the things that, that stuck out is, you know, coming up and, and working with these guys that you would go to, like, the Target Center in, in, in Minneapolis and you watch them compete. And, you know, these people are celebrities to me. You know, I, I never really had such a – too much of a, of a local mindset and just wanting to be the best in the area. But these guys were a big deal. You know, these are the guys that were fighting on TV television. You know, so being able to spar with, with Matt Vander would be the first, you know, what I would consider to be a big name in boxing. That, that spar with as a, as a you know, a – 's it's it's great to hear you you're so grounded as a fighter and as a man and are well aware of your roots and are quite proud of that and that's uh that's uh, very rare to find in this day and age why do you think that is for you you know I think that just comes down to people's personal you know perception on life and things like that like me I'm just uh, I'm thankful for what I have you know I, I, I never thought that you know when you're going a uh, uh, young kid from Minnesota that I would be at this stage being the only American on a, on a world boxing, on a world boxing super series. And, and you just, uh, every day that, that he realized that, yes, things could always be better, but you know, this is, I, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of where, where I'm at. I have a lot of pride for what, what I'm doing and what I've done. So, but I just have to sit down and, and, and reflect a lot of days, you know, reflect on, on where I'm at and I'm, I'm proud. I'm happy. You know, my family is, uh, my family is proud of me and happy for me. If I'm able to, to by myself and and uh, you know my, my now fiance you know we're 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 doing we're doing well and with that being said I mean, what else can you really ask for? Congratulations. So, uh, me a lot more time to, to, oh, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Um, so let's talk now. You you come out the amateurs. What was the decision for you to turn pro? Was it a bad decision or was it just your time? You know, it was just it was just time. You know, I had been on the national circuit. Since uh, I had turned, you know, 18 years old, you know, I've been winning national titles and being on the men's national team, and it was great. And then I ended up missing my shot for the the Olympics. You know, I have, you know, no uh, no ill will towards towards Marcus Brown. I'm, I'm a big fan of his. Who ended up being the representative from the United States, um, you know, uh, for the Olympic Games. And I just felt like it was time. You know, I I enjoyed, I enjoyed the amateurs. I got to travel the world, to go to places that I don't do. Uh, yeah. You're breaking up, Rob. You're breaking up. Rob? You got me? Yeah, I got you. Repeat that last bit again for me, please. Yep, I'm here. Yeah. Oh, oh I, was, I was just saying that, uh, you, know, I, I had been, uh, you know, I had seen the uh, different parts of the world that I never thought I would, uh, I would ever see. I had done, uh, you know, I competed the upper levels of the amateurs, and I just felt like it was it was time for me to go to the, you know, the professional ranks and really see, you know, there's a, there's a national champion every year in the United States, you know, in many places. Every year there's a new national champion, but, you know, and now it's time to see all the national champions, you know, they typically all go pro. Now it's time to see who the best of the best was. And, and I'm all about challenging myself and, and seeing, you know, how, how great I can be. So how did you connect with yeah, no, 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 no. Sorry. So how did you connect with Derek James then? Uh, myself and Earl Spence Jr. were on the national team together since uh, we were uh, in the under 19, you know, the kind of youth boxing, and then on forth all the way through it up until 2012. So I had uh, I'd known uh, uh, Spence, you know, pretty well, and uh, so I was coming down to a, to a point where uh, I was fighting this uh, this gentleman as my first southpaw. I was gonna fight, and we had a, a mutual friend uh, named Anthony Mack Jr., uh, who was also on the national team the, the same year as us. 
and I called up, we and him stayed pretty close, and I called him up, and I was like, hey, you know, tell me about this guy that you that you fought. And he was like, just come down for the sparring. Uh, Spence is here. You know, my, you know, we'll, uh, we'll do the sparring. I'll, I'll tell you about it when you get here. So, you know, I just, I booked a flight, and I, uh, I flew down to Dallas, and I was kind of in between trainers. You know, my, my first trainers were, were very old when I first started boxing. You know, one was 86 years old at the time. Uh, the other was uh, in his upper 70s. So this is the point where they were, you know, done being active as, as trainers and, and uh, one had passed. So it was uh, it was kind of uh, in between coaches. You know, I, was, I was working with a few guys, but I didn't really have a set coach. So I came down just to kind of get sparring in and hear more about the, my upcoming opponent. And I, and I got some sparring in with Spence. And uh, we had known each other, but it just did how much he had changed between the point we were in the amateurs and he was an Olympian. So, you know, a year and a half, two years later, when he had been a, you know, a distinguished pro. And then I, uh, I'd go down and uh, start working with uh, Derek James. You know, we knew each other from the amateurs, but I'd never worked with him before. Right. And so he was also training Anthony Mack. So I'd go with, with Mack to the uh, to the gym. And then uh, Derek was nice enough to just kind of hold nets a couple times. And, and I think he was, a, he was a, a little impressed with, you know, my ability to, to retain the things he was saying. Um, and that, you know... When you're in there with Spence, you know, it's, uh, it's sink or swim. You know, and I like to think that I, I kept my head just above water. <laughs> you know, at, at that point, you know, I kept my head just above water. So he was uh, he was impressed because typically when people get in there headed with the first time. Because, you know, he hits harder than, you know, any middleweight that I've been in there with. Wow. Um, and I was in I spent my first middleweight. Yeah, he, he punches like a mag truck. And, you know, I stood my ground and, 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 and boxed with him. And so from that point, we just started working together, you know, for that two weeks that I was in town. And then it came to my next fight, and I was like, hey, do you mind if I come down and, and work out with you a little bit more? And, yeah, sure. Come down. And then before I knew it, I was staying for longer amounts of time uh, in Texas than I was in Minnesota. And then uh, I just uh, made the move about uh, two and a half years ago or so. Wow. Okay, so um, between yourself and Spence, what what, what is Spence like as a, like as a sparring partner? What's he like? As a fighter, and he talked to you, alluded that he's a very heavy-handed guy. I mean, you're a middleweight, right? And he's a welterweight. So, I mean, when he when he's sparring with you, how much is he weighing when he's sparring with you? You know, I uh, it's hard to say. You know, I don't really put him on the scale too much, but I'd say he's you know he's in the upper 150s, you know, to mid 160s, but that's on the heavier end. You know, he can get pretty big, but usually when I'm sparring with him, and he you know he stays in, in such good shape. You know, he's, uh, he's a workaholic. So he's, uh, he's, he's very, uh, he's a man of few words, but, he, you know, he's got a kind of a, a quiet leadership about him. You know, he kind of leads by example. Right. So he's not the guy who's going to be screaming, you know, from the outside of the ring when he thinks he should be doing something. You know, he'll say a couple words when you're done. You know, he's, he's very level. He's very, level. He's, very uh, he's, a, he's a very good person. He's very, you know, he, he's in the ring. You know, of course, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's a predator. You know, he will go directly out. I'm sure, as, you, as you've seen in a, in a past fight. Yes. You know, if you if you took an inch, he'll take a mile. You know, so you have to. You know, I, I just don't see anybody in the welterweight division being able to, to withstand it. But uh, he's he's a uh, he's a quiet, strong personality. So when when he was about to fight for the world title, what was Rob Brandt thinking? How were you impacted by his performance? on the night and uh, what has it done for you since he's become world champion and what's it done for spence since he's become world champion oh spence you wouldn't you wouldn't even know the difference uh he's, he's in the gym like you know like he's still writing to get the title you know so you, you, would, you wouldn't know a difference between the day before and the day after he, he won the title but you know from my from my aspect it was just it, again it was a sense of uh, of like true pride you know i mean it, I got to, you know, to spar with him a fair amount uh, before that fight. Got to just kind of be around him when he was training. And he's just laser focused. You know, it's, it's the only thing he, you know, he set his goal to it and he attacked it full force. You know, and it was, it was such a great thing to see. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a very huge proud moment for myself to watch him win that title. Did that inspire you to th was, was far Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, Rob. Oh, I said it, but I was, I was far from surprised. So, you know, I, I knew that, uh, of course, I knew 
Because I was a Kelbrook fan, and I always said that I think that Kelbrook is the toughest fight for Spence in the welterweight division. And uh, if you get some first legs, I mean, I'm a, I like watching Keith Thurman work. You know, it's, it's great. But if you look at it, there's a longer list of people that are willing, they're wanting to fight Thurman than there is people who are wanting to fight Spence. And I think there's, there's a lot to be said for that. So, so Spence v. Thurman, in your opinion, what happens? Um, I think he had, I think he gets most of the body uh, around seven or eight. Wow. I think that the, the, I think, you know, I, after watching the Colazzo shot, it's not the first time I've seen uh, Thurman hurt to the body. Okay. I'm a fan of Keith Thurman. You know, I, I mean, I like watching him, uh, watching him compete, but I just think that there's definitely levels, and uh, and I think that the uh, the body attack was Spence, like as Colazzo almost folded him up with, with Thurman up with a. And when Spence lands one of something like that. I mean, the only thing you can expect is, is about six or seven more before the one to the head comes there, you know, to get there. So I just, uh, I don't see it being yet as it was with uh, with Brooke. But that's, you know, the personal thing. Wow. Um... In terms of Spence, I know that Derek has been pretty uh, vocal. He said that he could move up to middleweight and beat Gennady Golovkin. What are your thoughts on that, and how realistic do you think that would be? Yeah, I, think, I, I mean, I think it's realistic. I mean, yeah, this, this is, you know, I'm coming from a biased place. I'm, I, mean, I sit there, I watch him work every day. I don't know anything about, you know, Golovkin other than watching him stylistically. But I thought that uh, Daniel Jacobs definitely gave a, a good blueprint, as well as, uh, you know, Alvarez. But, uh, you know, he can, uh, like I said, he can punch harder than, than any middleweight that I've been in there with. And I'm, I'm not saying that Golovkin can't punch. I'm just saying that if, I feel like time's not necessarily on his side with, with that. I mean, Spence is doing nothing but getting better. And I think that he would, uh, I, I feel that he would, uh, he'd beat him as well. Give us your thoughts very quick. But he can't, well, got to be said for that granite chin that, that he has. Yes. You know, that uh, Golovkin has. I mean, you know, I, I'm not going to... He just, you know, he slops him and knocks him out in no time flat. Um, but I just think the, the the work rate. I mean, I've sat there and watched Spence do 17, 18 rounds straight and, and not look uh, completely fatigued. Okay, give us your thoughts on the Canelo fight with Gennady Golovkin. You know, it was an entertaining fight. I mean, I, I'm I'm okay with the draw. I wasn't okay with the you know the, that one scorecard. I thought that was you know. I thought that was a little ridiculous, but I was, I mean, it was a, it was a great fight. You know, the fans won, you know, whether, you know, how people feel one way or the other, there's arguments to be made for both. I thought that, um, Alvarez did a, did a great, you know, put on a great at boxing exhibition at times, but you know, then there was the points where Lovkin could really land some leather. Um, I thought that, uh, one thing that can be said for Alvarez, he can roll with a punch you mm -hmm. know, better than I've seen uh, a lot of guys uh, do it. So, I thought that he, uh, I thought he did well. I mean, it, I, I personally, if I were to give a decision, I probably would have given it to Golovkin. But, okay. you know, if you break it down, you watch it more than once and you take the emotion out of it, you know, I, it was a close fight. You know, and no, no, the, the, the fans won more than the, the fighters got a draw. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts regarding, um, regarding Kel Brook? People said that he quit against Gennady Golovkin and he quit against uh, uh, he, he quit against Spence. What are your thoughts about that, about a fighter quitting? Do you think it was fair because of his eye injury and he was looking after himself? Or do you think that he should have carried on and wait until he got himself knocked out? You know, that, that's a kind of a case-to-case -case basis. With the, with the Golovkin, that was his trainer. His trainer clearly saw that he wasn't reacting. He knows him best. A lot of the time I feel that it's, it's up to the trainer in order to make those decisions. Because um, the majority of fighters are going to be in there, and, you know, until something goes real bad, you know. And nobody wants to see that happen to a to a, to a fighter. But uh, I mean, yeah, did he quit against Spence? I, I think he did, but was it for right reasons? I, I think so. You know, if your your oral bone is broken, you're not seeing the shots, and you know, if you haven't been in there with Spence, you don't know what those punches are like. You know, with an eight-ounce glove. I mean, that's why, you know, welterweight is so intriguing to me. You know, it's uh, the biggest guys wearing the small hoods that can wear the small gloves. And this is a man that can, that can really punt. 
so uh yeah i, I absolutely agree um you know people uh, on the, people on the outside looking in look, think he's quick but you know nobody knows what it's like to have their eye socket like that removed like in the position like that so he's done what's best for his career in his future so Um, uh, like I said, I mean, I, I wasn't standing in his shoes, so I can't say, of course, you know, being a fighter myself, I, you know, you always think, like, me, yeah, no, they're going to have to carry me out of there, but I remember in a position where I could not see and a power puncher like that was hitting me continuously. Okay. You know, you, you know what's going on in your body, so, I mean, I respect the decision. Okay, I was, we, I watched a fight that was uh, of you, I think it was against Perez, um, on Showbox, where you knocked him out with the right hand. You, you, you know the fight I'm talking about, Showbox? No, you, sir. Right. Now, I remember the commentator. Yeah. yeah. That's the one, brother. That's the one. And I remember the commentator saying, oh, you know, Rob Brandt is his, his step up fight. You know, as I do the commentator, he's a step up fight. You know, he's looked really good for his step up fight. And then obviously you land the right hand and knocked him out. Was that right hand something he, that you, you, you premeditated or was it just something that was just let go naturally? Rob, you there? Oh. I'm here. Oh, yep, I got you. Yep, I got you. Yeah, it was something that we uh, we worked in the gym uh, quite often. And, uh, you know, something was actually saying in the corner. If they ever, you know, if they, if they mic'd it, uh, if you could hear it in the corner, it was actually saying, you know, step over. He's stepping over with the, throw that right hand go over his shoulder. And then the, uh, the golden opportunity, it was like the clouds parted and the beam of light hit, and it just, and it, uh, it landed. Of course, you know, you can tell by the look on my face, you can't ever expect a knockout like that. So I was probably one of the most surprised people in the in the facility in the, in the room, but it was uh, you know, it was something we definitely worked on. But it was it was him making a huge mistake when me doing something right at the exact same time. So would Rob Brandt consider himself a puncher, a puncher boxer, a slickster? What do you consider yourself, Rob? Yeah, I consider myself a uh, boxer puncher. Um, of course, that's kind of more up to, you know, it's going to go by a case-to-case -case basis with the fight. You know, some guys just have those grand chins, in which case got a box. But my coach always tells me, if you can hurt him every round, hurt him every round. And we and we train that way. So I like to I like to consider myself a puncher, especially, you know, later on, uh, since I started working with Derek. I mean, it's, it's been, you know, more knockouts than not since I've been with Derek. What is it you think Derek James brings to the table for you? Um, he brings a level of defense, which which gives the confidence in order to be in the in the pocket. You know, the the, the way you get you know these knockouts isn't necessarily just kind of throwing. If you, if you you know you're nervous, you're going to get hit back and possibly hurt or knocked out. You know, that's uh, you know, I have that. I feel like very confident in my defense, very confident stepping forward to a fighter now. Right. So he really gave me a, a, a mass amount of of confidence. Um, in my in my punching ability, uh, because I know I can defend myself. So I can I can throw the punch, you know, with with full intent to knock somebody out without being, uh, you know, scared of the counter. I don't have to be nervous or scared of someone throwing something back if I know that I'm I'm safe and secure behind my defense. That's what that's that's perfect. That's fantastic. Um, how tall are you, Rob? I am six foot even. Six foot even. OK, I only asked that in terms of for the weight, because you talked about fighting at light heavyweight and then being, you know, in now the super middleweight tournament. And of course, you box at middleweight. So talk to us about the weight up and down for you. Um, you know, as, as an amateur, I just never really believed in, in cutting weight, you know, especially when you have these five, six day tournaments where you have to make weight every day. I didn't want to be one of those people that had to put on a sauna suit and go take off. I had a coach tell me, you know, early on, you're not going to find easier fights at different weight classes than the amateurs. You're just going to find different sized people. So I just, you know, I felt like I was comfortable. I, I liked eating, you know, and, uh, of course I was fully dedicated, but you know, when you're fighting that many days in a row, I just I felt like that was where I was comfortable at was just fighting. You know, I come in a lot lighter. I come in 172, 170, things like that. But, uh, I was, I was comfortable and I was fast, especially for the weight class. So then we went pro. I was like, you know, I was watching, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, at this point, I was a fun boxing fan. And then you look at, you know, the Sergey Kovalev of the world. And you're like, yeah, you know, I don't think that 
light heavyweight would quite be for me in the, in the pro rank. You know, I'm maybe I'm more about 168 pounder. And then I started, you know, getting serious about my diet and uh, really putting in a lot of the road work. And then uh, before I knew it, I was you know, sparring underneath the 668 pound limit. So I was like, yeah, we're just going to do 60. You know, and then from that point, you know, like early on in my career and things like that, I'd always come in around one, you know, 57, 158, 156, you know, so I, I mean, I just, as long as you're, you're dedicated toward doing the, the work, you know, the, the weight's uh, never going to be an issue. I tried 154 one time, that was too small. You know, I came in at about 152 points on the pound, 0.8 pounds. That was, that was too much for me. I learned that, you know, relatively quick. That was a bit too, uh, a bit too small. Okay. But uh, 160 I was comfortable with. And then the opportunity for this, this tournament came up. And uh, I just, uh, I, 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 I felt confident in going at 68. You know, I feel strong. I feel like I've been, I've been working hard. And, uh, you know, it's hard to pass up something of this scale. You know, this is the point where you can really, you know, get your name in, in lights and then really, I mean, if you feel like you're not going to get beat by anybody, like I do not feel like I can get beat by uh, anybody, then uh, this is the point where you go from being a, you know, showbox style uh, boxer to one of the people mentioned on, on pay-per-view cards and things like that. Okay, so we, 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 we're on the verge of you going into the world, the Super 6, the Super 8, sorry. How much did Andre Ward's um, entry to the Super 6 back then as an American uh, mean to you? And do you, do you draw comparisons between yourself and Ward as possibly an underdog in this tournament? Oh, yeah, you know, that, absolutely. I've actually really been a huge fan of Andre Ward. So it was, uh, you know, I, I followed him. You know, he, was, uh, he was the last U.S. gold medalist, uh, Olympic gold medalist. So I, I always kind of considered him kind of, a, you know, a, an American sports hero. So it was always, uh, you know, it never really crossed my mind until other people started drawing the comparison between the, the American that wasn't, you know, wasn't considered the one who was going to win the tournament. Um, until, you know, kind of later on when I'm, uh, when I'm going to the events like the gala and things like that. Yes. I'm like, oh, I suppose, that, you know, this is, this is very similar. But I always, you know, I, I hold a lot of these, uh, these boxes in such a high regard that, you know, it's hard to say. I'm the next this, or I'm the next that. You know, I just respect their careers and uh, and follow them. You know, as a fan, more than anything. So uh, it was. You know, when other people brought it to my attention, you know, I kind of thought, wow, you know, that's that's definitely a route that I'd be willing to go. You know, the Andre Ward route. So that's. that's I know. Where I'm, uh, that's what I'm actually you know. When you when you was stood in that booth waiting to get selected, like um. Uh, a girl waiting for a date on blind date and probably a guy selecting which guy he's going to dance with or he's going to take on his date. Uh, when, when, when that was going on, there was obviously Eubank Jr., the senior was there selecting opponents. What was going through your mind when you're seeing the various top seeds going through, picking their opponents? What was going through your mind and, and who did you really want to get picked by? You know, honestly, I thought that I was going first round. You know, I kind of figured the, the first, you know, I'm the, I'm the only American in the tournament. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm moving up from uh, from middleweight to super middleweight. I'm thinking these guys are going to think they're, they're going to shoot at a target, you know. And then, uh, I, then I kind of got a, a little bit of a, of a gust that, you know, that Cox and Groves kind of had a had a little thing and they wanted to fight each other. So I was like, okay, well, that's fine. Well, I'm definitely going in the second round and then there's, there's no way. So I stood there and I just was, you know, trying to, to make eye contact and and I was just prepared to go second. And also he, showed, he decided to go with, uh, Cal Smith decided to go there to Copeland. I was like, oh, well, all right, that sounds good. And then uh, Eubank Sr. pops up there. And, you know, he's just a fun guy with his antics. So I just locked my, locked my eyes on him and I just wanted to, you know, just stare at him the entire time, let him know I wasn't scared or intimidated. And I knew that for a fact, Looking down, and then he says, "That be." I'm like, "Oh, all right." And then so I look over across. I'm like, "Oh, it's just in, in Bramer next." Of course, I, I I watched everybody. If I knew being the fourth seed, I just I never really imagined that it'd be me and myself and Bramer in the first round. But I was uh, I was fine with that. At that point, you know, I knew that I was I was going to be watching film with a purpose, knowing that I had a you know a target in mind. So this was uh, maybe we just went from there. You know, and 
from that point forward, I've just been uh, doing nothing but watching tape on Bramer and, and training specifically for him. Have you, um, when you look at the other guys, let's talk, for example, the first fight, Groves versus Cox. Any thoughts on that fight for you? Um, I, I, have, I, I personally, I think that it'll be Groves. Of course, in boxing, you can't make any 100% predictions, but I feel like Groves is a naturally bigger guy. He's a phenomenal athlete. Um, he's been at the upper level uh, for quite some time. You know, it was one of my favorite fights was him fighting uh, Frog Gosh. in that entrance. <laughs> Walking out, smoking the crowd a little bit, shaking his head. You know, I loved that. You know, yes. I, I loved it. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, just from a fan standpoint, I'm going to go. I'm not as familiar with uh, with Cox. Okay. Um, I'm going to grow. Uh, Eubank Jr. and Anvil. Um, you know, I, it's going to be entertaining. I, I think that uh, I'm going to go with. Uh, um, Eubank Jr. on that one, even though I I don't want to count out uh, Edville, uh, Ed Edville, uh, I believe he's uh I mean, he's they call him a dentist for a reason. He is in your face, he's in, in shape, he's got a heart. I mean, the size of his entire chest. Um, he'll be fun to watch. I just think the athleticism of Eubank Jr. might be a bit much once he starts moving. Um, he's a shorter guy. He's a bit of a shorter guy, so he's just, I, I feel like the inside fighting aspect is going to have an edge. But once, uh, you know, Eubank Jr. starts moving around a little bit, I feel like he's going to struggle. So I feel like, you know, his, his outside boxing ability is a little bit limited. What were your thoughts on uh, Callum Smith's performance against Suckland? Oh, it was a great fight. I thought, was, I thought it was a great, great fight. You know, I, I, you know Callum Smith has a, has a great uh, uh, counter right hand and a sneaky little kind of faint jab left uppercut. You know, he catches people's uppercuts coming in. He, he knows how to use his length really well. Um, but what, what was proven with uh, Skoglund is, you know, once you break on the inside of that, he's a guy that can be hit. Um, but it was, uh, like I said, it was a very fun, entertaining fight. Um, I just thought he was uh, a little bit more, uh, a little bit uh, easier to hit than I think that uh, I gave him credit for before the fight. I wouldn't say easier to hit, but I would say that uh, Skoglund gave, uh, gave his A performance. Okay. And then obviously you've got yourself and Mr. Bremer. Talk to me about Jurgen Bremer. First of all, my concern for Bremer, I spoke to uh, Rick Glazer. He's been in the sport for many years, over 80, 85 years old, a boxing promoter. I'm sure you know who he is. Um, Rick was talking, promote, was actually talking about this fight with you. And uh, he said that Bremer coming down from super, from light heavy down to super middleweight at the age he was, wasn't good for his body, wasn't good for his skin, and you stood a great chance. And if you don't plaster him, somebody else will. Yeah. I mean, like I said, you don't really get stronger, especially at that age, moving down in weight as you do going up. Um, but, you know, he's, he's a crafty. I mean, there's nothing, there's not going to be much I can do that's going to surprise a guy who's been in the game. He's had 51 fights at this point. Um, you know, he's uh, not going to be a whole lot you can surprise him. So you don't want to sleep on a guy that, you know, has this much experience in the sport. Uh, I think that his, his record shows that he's a little bit bigger of a puncher than I think he actually is. Um, but, you know, I, I like to watch the, the earlier fights. You know, I don't like to watch, like, the, the him and Cleverly so much. I like to expect the, the best version of Bramer. But okay. One of the best version of Bramer, he, he can be athletic at times. Uh, he gets really sneaky with his left hand. You know, he seems to base everything off his left hand. You know, he tries to keep you guessing whether he's going to throw, you know, a, a left hook, uh, a straight left, or a, kind of a left uppercut to the body. You know, he kind of likes to fish around with that with that right hand when he's when he's out. Um, he's not an overly fast. He, he's got a decent amount of power, but uh, like I said, he's not a, not necessarily a world beater. But so, how does Rob Brandt close the gap in terms of experience? Because he's vastly more experienced, been a world champion, seen it, done it, been there, multiple defenses. How do you close the gap? Um, you know, I just have to be. I have to be better. I have to use the, you know, the the attributes that I have. I know that I'm going to be faster. I know that I'm going to be far more athletic. And I, I mean, I'm just going to have to kind of flood him in a way. You know, I mean, sitting back and playing his game isn't going to work. So we're we're working on multiple different, you know, tactics and things, and be able to switch up and be and be versatile. So a lot of it's going to be just a lot of reactionary uh, work. You know, we have to see what he wants us to do and, and be able to, to counter and beat him. Not necessarily add his game, but take him out of his element a little bit. Do you feel I think the, that after so many rounds, he's going to uh, he'll soften. Do you feel the 
you feel that you have to go for the knockout against Bremer because you're in Germany? The thought crossed my mind, but I don't like to uh, think about things that are just clearly not in my control. Um, you know, I, I, I have no control over what the, the judges feel. My job is just to beat him in every round, hurt him in every round. I mean, if I happen to get the knockout, I happen to get the knockout. But uh, I'm just uh, I'm just focused on making sure that I beat him. I, I do feel that you know uh, the opportunity is there to knock him out and, and to get him out. And I'm going to uh, I'm going to jump on that opportunity when it when it arises. That was. You know, like I said, I, I try not to worry too much about, you know, I have to knock him out because that, that can get myself into, into, you know, positions that I don't want to be in. How much do you read into what boxing writers, pundits, broadcasters, podcasts, Twitter, Facebook people say about Bremer being old and over the hill? Do you read into that and think, well, oh, I've just got to go out and get the knockout? I actually, I actually have not read almost any press. This is one of my first interviews that I've done. I don't read uh, boxing sites or I, uh, I don't read the, the Twitter feed or, or anything like that. I, I try to stay away from it because I like the, the focus on, like I said, the best version of Bramer. I kind of consider every person that I fight, I turn them into this kind of Superman style <laughs> personality or, or character just because that's going to bring the best out of me. You know, right. If I start going in there thinking, uh, oh yeah, this guy's old. He's got nothing left in the tank. I'm just going to go in there and, and clean him out. You know, like I said, that's, that's you know, one surprises to happen you know so i like to go in there thinking this is which it is you know it's the biggest fight and the toughest fight of my career so therefore just treat it that way okay let's talk about a one billy joe saunders recently beat willie monroe jr um talk to me about that fight your thoughts on willie monroe's performance and uh your old your your, your thoughts on billy joe saunders um you know i thought that uh you know William Monroe Jr. has all of the athletic gifts he could possibly give a person. I just wanted, I was screaming at the screen, just let your hands go. Just do something. You know, I mean, evading punches and, and moving around on the outside doesn't win you fights. You know, it, you know, it's great ring generalship, but you have to you have to land some leather. Um, so, I mean, a lot of that was just frustration. Cause I, I like uh, William Monroe Jr. I think he's one of the most athletic guys in the, in the division. He just kind of had his hands in his pockets a bit. For the fight, and, you know, Saunders is going to be Saunders. He's going to be a bit brash. He's, he's in your face. He's going to be talking crazy. But one thing that you uh, you have to give him is that he wins. You know, I mean, despite how uh, some people may feel about him, uh, about his his personality, you know, he does win, and he finds a way to, to get it done. How would Rob Brandt go? Great, how does Rob Brandt go about fighting someone like Billy Joe Saunders? In his opinion. You have to, you have to, you know, give him a reason to, to stand his back foot. You know, if you allow him to play his game where he kind of nickel and dimes you all day and sits back and moves his head, uh, force him to fight you. You have to force him to, you know, to go man man and fight you. Because I think that when he gets as when he gets as big as he does in between fights, um, it's going to be tough to sustain a high output. Hmm. That's interesting. Bank Jr. I think you sp spoke about it before. Well, he believes he's going to win the tournament. His dad thinks he beats Golovkin and he's the best thing since sliced bread. What are your thoughts on Eubank Jr.? But it, particularly now that he's in the super middleweight tournament and you may face him. Yeah, I mean, you know what? I think that he's a great fighter, not necessarily a flawless boxer. Um, yeah, you know, they, they, they talk the talk. That is, that is for sure, and they've definitely had some, some great fights, and they've, they've, you know, they've done well in, uh, in their career thus far. Um, but, you know, I always go back and I watch the, every time someone talk, talks about how invincible they think that Eubank Jr. is how he's going to run through the tournament, I think he'll have uh, quite a time with Groves if they end up meeting. 
um, just due to the fact that we watch with, you know, Billy Joe Saunders, I mean, put on uh, quite a boxing clinic at points in that fight. And I think the Groves is a phenomenal boxer and he's bigger. So, I mean, I, I'd just be more interested to see that fight. be tough to, uh, you know, it's tough to say too much bad about him because he's, he's looked so good. But I think he definitely has a lot of defensive flaws. You know, but uh, you can pick anybody apart and say the things that you uh, think that they are or they aren't. But he seems to be, you know, performing since his loss to uh, Saunders. But, uh, yeah, I mean, they, uh, if you listen to him, though, yeah, they are the greatest things since sliced bread. <laughs> would you – do you – um? Would you pay, or would you pay to watch Billy Joe Saunders defend his title against Amir Khan? Uh, just say it one more time. Would you pay to watch Amir Khan and Billy Joe Saunders fight? Uh, would I pay to see it? Yeah. No, if it was on television, watch it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd go to a friend's house to watch it, but would I pay my money to see it? No, I personally wouldn't. But I mean, I'm sure it'd be a fun fight. You know, but I'm kind of done seeing Amir Khan move up to middleweight. You know, I think that, you know, him and Kel Brook, I'd, I'd pay to see him and Kel Brook fight. <laughs> <laughs> You're starting trouble over in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I wouldn't say to see Amir Khan and Billy Joe Saunders fight, no. Okay, okay. Um, let me think, Rob. I don't think there's much more I can ask you at this minute in time, apart from... I've got to say, is there anything you think I should have asked you that I haven't asked you? You know, I think we, we, we covered it pretty well. Um, I feel pretty good. feel pretty confident. It was a great interview. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Let me see if there's anybody in the room. Let, let me just ask very quickly. Does anybody, does anybody in the room got any question to ask uh, Rob Bravo Brant? Rob, um, by the way, where's the name Bravo come from, by the way? I've got to ask that before you go. My, I had some coaches. They were uh, I, I was on the national circuit, you know, competing in the you know the national scene for U.S. boxing for a long time. And then it was my my last term at the Olympic trials. My coach was in the lobby, and he saw this other coach, uh, Ben Bustier from uh, the Bay Area, uh, which is like the, the west coast of uh, in California. Yes. And uh, you know, my my coaches always call me Robbo. Hey, Robbo, let's go, Robbo. And then this uh, this coach was like, "Hey, where's Bravo at?" And my coach was like, "Well, what are you talking about? What do you mean? Who's Bravo? You know the the light heavyweight, you know light." Like... And he thought it was the funniest thing that for years this man was calling me Bravo, and I just didn't really catch it. Yeah, I've known him for a long time, but he, he called me Bravo. So he goes like, "You know, you know what Ben thought your name was was uh was Bravo for like the last five years?" Oh dear. I was like, "Really?" And uh, so from that point, I was like, that's it. When I go pro, I'm going with Bravo. Okay. So my last amateur tournament also gave me my name. Bravo. Fantastic. Well, Bravo. Um, I have one thing to ask as well. Um, a very good friend of mine on a YouTube channel, his name is Mr. Boxing Today, said that he actually uh, did some sparring with you. Do you know Mr. Boxing Today? You might have come under some other name. but yeah, he's, actually, he's actually big on, uh, he's actually big, uh, on heavyweight boxing a lot. Yes. Like, follow a lot of heavyweight. Yeah, so I'm doing, yeah, I do remember that. Minnesota. Absolutely. What was it like? Very nice guy. I mean, he's very cool. I mean, you know, he's uh he hops right in there. Um he's a big he's a big dude. He's a big guy himself. And uh, you know, usually when they're a little bigger like that, I just thought, you know, I had something to prove a little bit. I just always wanted, especially as an amateur. Yeah. Um really good guy. You know, he uh I mean we would add it for I think I'm gonna say it was like, you know, three rounds, three, four rounds or so. And uh, he's just a really, really cool guy. We spoke afterward. You know, he, we, we, you know, you could shove this. He hit me with this, man. That was really nice. You know, he'd give me the, like, yeah, yeah, I really like your speed and this and that. He's just a, a very, very cool guy. It wasn't one of those uh, sparring sessions where anybody was nasty to each other or anything like right. that. Or, yeah, yeah, I will do it as I did this. Like, it was nothing like that. He was just a really, really cool, really nice guy. Well, do you have a message to Mr. Boxing today? Because he's always on our channel watching our stuff and we watch his stuff all the time. So you have a quick message to him. Tell him I watch a lot of his videos, subscribe to him on YouTube. Fantastic. Rob, uh, I don't think there's anybody in the room at the moment because everyone's quite happy with the interview we've done. Um, we want to follow you. BWTM want to follow you exclusively through the tournament and uh, just wish you all the best. And as I said, if you could send us some footage for our fans and uh, boxing uh, supporters, we'd appreciate it. 
and uh yeah um how do people follow you rob by the way i'm on uh, instagram uh robert brand at robert brand usa uh it's the same uh handle for uh twitter as well and uh, i have a fan page on facebook as well as a personal page which is uh robert brand robert bravo brand thank you so much for be, being on bwtm sports welcome to the family and we look forward to hearing from you soon Thank you, champ. See you soon. See you soon. So there you have it, people. Rob Brandt makes his debut on BWTM Sports, and we'll be following his journey at the World Boxing Super Series. I hope you've enjoyed the interview. I hope you've enjoyed getting to know Rob Brandt that much more. As he said, we were the first, BWTM are the first to have got the interview with Rob Brandt with regards to him being in the tournament, exclusive to BWTM Sports. I hope you've enjoyed the interview. I hope you've learned a bit more about Rob Brandt. And uh, we'll continue to give you and bring you the best interviews possible with the name, big names around the world. We'll be still trying to chase up Abel Sanchez. I'll be looking to chase up the likes of Abel Sanchez and James Ali Bashir. Stay tuned because you never know with BWTM Sports when we'll get the next interview. We may even get Sanchez tonight. So stay tuned. Thank you all for watching. That's been Rob Brandt. Me, Ingram Jones. We're out. Take care.